According to Mercedes, the future is all electric, but they're going about the transition with typical German pragmatism. Rather than canceling models and replacing them with full electric vehicles, we're seeing a reimagining of Mercedes lineup in electric form. This is the all new Mercedes Benz EQE, the midsize E class electric vehicle, if you will, but it's not an electric E class. Unlike some car companies that are making gasoline and electric versions of the same vehicle, Mercedes has designed two entirely different vehicles in the same segment, one optimized for electric only operation and the other designed for more traditional buyers. That's going to be the new E class for 2024. Logically, at some point in time, the EQE and the E-Class may either get merged or replaced by a single electric model. Probably something similar is going to happen with the EQS and the S-Class at some point in time. But in the meantime, consider this just a different expression of the Mercedes design formula that happens to be electrified. So pretty familiar look up front, definitely swoopy and rounded because obviously coefficient of drag is very important for an electric vehicle. So this has that same sort of jelly bean like shape that we find in the EQS, but it's not simply a scaled down EQS, which I appreciate which is actually a little bit different than some of Mercedes' other vehicles. The C-Class, the E-Class, and the S-Class definitely look different, but I think they're a little bit more similar than the EQE versus the EQS. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section. We, of course, have the full LED headlights up there and not a lot of openings up front because even though this is the over 600 horsepower AMG model, you still don't need a lot of cooling. It's really just happening down there. And this is on with the cabin temperature set to 65, so definitely very quiet. With a price tag that spans from around $76,000 to well over $100,000, logically, there are a lot of vehicles you could compare against the EQE. But in terms of direct comparisons in the US at the moment, the closest is probably the Genesis G80 Electrified, because it's right in the same size category as this. This is almost exactly the same size as the E-Class, positioned right between the Model S and the Model 3 in terms of general dimensions. The Model S competitor would be more appropriately the EQS. The Model 3 competitor in the EQ lineup doesn't exist yet. It's probably going to be an EQC and we'll probably see that at some point soon. Aside from the G80, you could logically cross shop this against something like the Porsche Taycan or the Audi rendition of that Porsche Taycan. But this is going to be roomier inside because the Taycan is quite small and the mission of this is E-Class reimagined. So E-Class interior room and for this model, E63 like performance. And that's why we see a bunch of AMG specific changes on this EQE, like the AMG wheels wrapped in 265 with summer tires up front, 295 with summer tires in the back, and then hiding behind those wheels, carbon ceramic brakes with absolutely massive calipers on them. Even though this can regenerate a huge amount of power back into its battery pack, we have massive brakes, so this can stop about as short as the average performance midsize sedan. This model gets really close to 100 feet stopping distance, even though it is definitely way heavier than an E63. Let me know what you think of the EQE's design. It's definitely jelly bean like the EQS, but I think it's a little bit more attractive and it's punctuated by some things that break up the rounded lines like this ducktail spoiler right on the top. Of course, we get these typical little black blocks on each side of the license plate. Those are not terribly attractive. They're here because of the bumper standards that we have in the US and the way that Mercedes decides to achieve compliance for that particular standard. The tail lights are of course full LEDs. We have a really tiny backup light right there in the middle. The turn signal turns amber when it's activated and when it's off, everything is clean and red there. It's a really elegant look. The third brake light is integrated right there just above that ducktail spoiler. Like the EQS, the EQE does not have a front trunk and in fact Mercedes hides away the hood release under a little panel in the dashboard because theoretically no user serviceable parts are under here, although we do find coolant reservoirs obviously for the various systems that need cooling in the vehicle. Windshield wiper fluid, that's added via a strange little slot that I'll show you in a moment over here on the driver's side. Under this mass of plastic, we find the electric motor, we find drivetrain electronics, the heat pump, the HVAC system, and some absolutely enormous cabin air filters. There are actually two of them stacked together, and they're about 24 by 30 inches wide. So these are about the same size as the HVAC filters you might find in a decent sized apartment. The rest of this is reserved for crash structure. And then of course we have the relatively low uh, height of this vehicle in the front, which also adds to the no front equation. It doesn't even have hood struts, which is why it is currently being supported by that tripod. Now let's dive into the electric motors. The EQE 350 is where the line starts. That gives you a single electric motor in the back, 288 horsepower, 564 pound-feet of torque. 
Clearly, without the electric motor up front, they could have rearranged things, but that likely would have cost more. You can get all-wheel drive in the EQE 350. That would be the EQE 350 4Matic. Still 288 horsepower, still 564 pound-feet of torque, but you get a second motor up front. All EQEs use the same battery pack, including this AMG model. It's a new 90.6 kilowatt hour unit based sort of around the one that we see in the EQS, only smaller in capacity. If you want more oomph and all wheel drive, there's the EQE 500 formatic that brings things up to 402 horsepower, 633 pound feet of torque, or there is this, the AMG EQE. 677 horsepower, 738 pound feet of torque with the boost mode that's gonna require a package option. This one does not have that, so it is a slightly less bonkers 617 horsepower, 701 pound feet of torque, but still a thoroughly bonkers zero to 60 time. That 90.6 kilowatt hour battery pack is charged via an onboard level two charger rated at 9.6 kilowatts. That is a little bit slower than I had expected. I kind of expected this to be an 11 or 12 kilowatt unit. And on DC fast charging, this will take down power at a peak rate of 170 kilowatts. But like the EQS, it will maintain that for a really long time, giving this a 30 minute charge window, 10% to 80% state of charge. That is slower than the Genesis G80 electrified. That will do 10 to 80% in about 22 minutes because it has a higher peak rate. Although the charge curve is not quite as flat as the one that we find in here. I suppose it's logical since most Mercedes models are leased at least by the first owner, but the only user serviceable fluid is the windshield wiper fluid that's in this little door over here on the driver's side. Other than that, theoretically everything under the hood doesn't need to be touched until the average ownership period has expired. The other small door to know about is the charge door in the back. It's where you find the CCS charge point and the J1772 AC connector. After a week with the EQE, I found the driver and front passenger seats to be very comfortable. As we see in other Mercedes models, the controls are somewhat split, so we find the four-way lumbar support down here on the seat itself. Uh, in this particular vehicle, you don't adjust it with the screen. We have a powered tilt telescopic memory link steering wheel that's associated with the three position memory over there on the driver's door, which is also where we find the rest of the controls for the driver's seat. Things like the adjustable thigh cushion, the adjustable headrests, which are adjusted electronically. And then we find the exact same controls over here for the front passenger seats. But in this particular model, we don't have ventilated seats up front. We just find heated seats. Jumping into the back seat, we find a seating position and legroom figures that are pretty similar to the E-Class. We have just under 80 inches of combined legroom back here, which is pretty solid for a midsize luxury vehicle. Moving to the middle, you'll notice we have a hump in the middle, which I do find interesting since this is a dedicated battery electric platform. In the middle, my head does touch the ceiling here. If I scoot all the way over to this side where the front seat was all the way back in its tracks, you can see I still have about two inches of legroom left. So you'd have no problem fitting a six foot tall adult up front and a rear facing child seat behind. Now in this seating position, one thing I should mention is that the side sills definitely are a little bit closer to my head than in an E-Class. This is also something we see in the EQS. It's part of the aerodynamic profile. It really tapers in towards the rear. We see this in a decent number of EVs. If you want a little bit more headroom and a little bit more room beside the head, you're gonna have to wait for the EQE SUV. It's likely gonna be a bit boxier here like the EQS SUV is. Back here in the rear, we find red shoulder belts for the outboard seating positions, black seat belt for the center seat position. And nope, I couldn't find any way to fold them from in here, but we can fold the center section. This is a 40-20-40 folding seat back. No ski pass through, but we do get the larger slot of this center section folding down. Although we do have that hump, rear seat passengers get air vents right there in the middle console. And we also have some USB-C charge ports that pop down from that little door in the rear. As I said at the beginning of the video, the EQE is a sedan, not a lift back like the EQS. So we have a pretty traditional trunk back here with very similar dimensions to the Mercedes E-Class, only this is a little bit taller. So in our 24 inch roller bag test, I was able to squeeze five 24 inch roller bags back here and four is the norm for a gasoline midsize sedan. Over here, we have buttons for the power trunk lid. We also find buttons to recline the rear seats, which is kind of a handy touch. And those are powered so that we don't have to do it manually. In case you're wondering, no, the rear seats don't power back up, however. Under the load floor, we have a bit of additional storage space. This is where we find the included EVSC. It is just a 120 volt cable though. So if you wanna charge faster than just over one kilowatt, you're going to have to get your own EVSC aftermarket. This is also where we find the can of fix a flat tire inflator and a tow hook. 
Now, clearly, since this model is about $30,000 over the base price, there are going to be lots of things in here you don't find in the base model. Over here, we have pretty standard size sun visors. They do slide to extend, which is a nice touch. We also have a panoramic two-pane moonroof. The front pane opens, which is a really cool touch, something that you don't find in a Model S. We also get a very sizable section right back there for the rear passengers. So that way, they can see what's going on up front. We have four-way adjustable headrests. They go in and out manually, and then they go up and down powered and memory linked. We also have high adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger with those red shoulder belts. Lots of red accent stitching going on. We have a microfiber center section to the seat, leather outer section right there. It's a sort of tricolor setup where this is a different color than this outboard section, and that's a different material and a slightly different color as well. Moving down here, you can see why we don't have the ventilated seats because of that microfiber design. We also find a extending thigh cushion there that kind of narrows the seat design as it goes towards the front. I don't find that quite as comfortable as some of Mercedes' other seat designs, but it's still definitely better than not having the extended cushion at all. Moving over to the front doors, we find a different design and a different theme than we find in the EQS. We have, again, lots of premium materials, microfiber, middle section to the door, those control panels that kind of stick up from the door. They look like they kind of hover window switches, metal speaker grills, lots of ambient lighting running around, and this chrome strip that goes all the way from the doors on over across the dashboard. And that chrome strip ends up integrating with the air vents right here in the center of the dashboard. More stitched material on the upper section of the dashboard that's kind of a light gray. We then find this very linear wood, which I really love. I love the fact that Mercedes is still giving us lots and lots of wood trim inside their EVs. This has a very attractive, very warm feel to it that we don't find in a lot of of EVs. A lot of EVs tend to be very cold inside. Down here we have more microfiber. Over here we have the glove compartment. The button can be difficult to find, but it's right over there. It is a slot style glove compartment. I was barely able to fit an 11 inch tablet computer inside. Some of the larger ones would have troubles fitting. In this particular vehicle, we just have the one screen right here in the center. It is one of their taller rather than wider infotainment systems. You can see the home button right there. It supports Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. It actually has a pretty wide format for Android Auto, enough, uh, or actually I should say CarPlay, enough that we get three rows of icons there. So the format is definitely a bit taller than in some. Down here we have some of the native buttons for the climate control functions. Those are found only on the touch screen. And then we have a row of separate touch buttons down here Take us over to the AMG screen, the cameras, charging information right there, vehicle settings. This is a fingerprint sensor. We have power button for the system, mute, and then a volume slider right over there. This is the latest software from Mercedes. It's their MBUC software. It is pretty responsive, but it is not as uh, intelligently or, or I guess should say intuitively laid out as some of the competition. Uh, you'll notice that over here, if we go to these settings, we have seat kinetics, but no seat massage in this particular vehicle. Moving down from there, we find a very large storage area. Uh, this cover slides like that. We have lots of black plastic going on here, piano black, uh, and you can insert a cup holder setup. That is it right there. So if I can do this one handed, uh, you can insert it over here and it will actually latch in place right like that for your drinks. It's a pretty decently sized cup holder, but it does block the wireless charger, which I think is kind of a strange thing. We have two USB-C inputs there and lots of storage under that area in the center console. Of course, this is an EV, so we have a pretty flat floor there. Not completely flat, but you'll also see we do have some USB ports right there at that very front end. Those are a little bit more awkward to use. Going back here, we have a bifold center armrest. Again, very deep storage area since there's not a lot going on under there as far as the vehicle goes. That closes and you can see that it's leather wrapped on top. On the driver's side, there's no heads up display, but we do have a full LCD cluster and it has a bunch of different themes. Uh, this is the track pace theme. I kind of like this super sport theme where it gives us the power levels over here for the torque and the horsepower, both charge and power output from the battery. And you'll notice that as I change drive modes, we get these little red lines that kind of move down from the top. That's the power limit because this will only put out the maximum power in Sport Plus or in individual mode. If we move over here to snow mode, you can see that it's greatly reduced. Then we also have a more traditional display if you'd rather have classic dials, very much like the rest of the Mercedes lineup, an understated view, a navigation only view. We also have an assistance view where if you're out on the highway, you can see other vehicles around. You can see that the car has actually detected that 
there is an old Jeep parked right in front of us. So very Tesla-like as far as that representation. It's worth noting that Mercedes have long done this, but Tesla's the one that decided that maybe you ought to be able to see little icons on the screen. Moving out from there, we definitely have a very AMG steering wheel. It has split spokes on the side, split spoke down there, lots of buttons and controls going on. Let's break them down. We have regen paddles on the back over here, down and up over there. These are obviously not shift paddles since there's nothing to shift. Over here, we have the touch controls for the multifunction LCD cluster. We then find a very similar set of buttons over here on the right side. Those control the LCD infotainment system. Also infotainment buttons over here on this side, volume slider, it's a touch slider, which is kind of a, an odd thing. I think actually would rather have a knob or a physical button for that one. Then over here, we have the controls for the adaptive cruise control system. Then we have these illuminated buttons and knobs. Over here, it's a touch screen, so you can actually change what these two different sections do. So you can have the traction stability control, the uh, AMG dynamic screen pop up, you can have things like the suspension, and then I have buttons over here. There are actually two little buttons. If I uh, push them down, you'll see that it will change the mode and that will actually change color based on what we're doing there. Then over on this side, we have the drive controller knob. You rotate that around to change your drive mode. It's also a button in the middle. I skipped over these on the passenger side, but we should take a look at these really cool turbine air vents. You'll find two of them in this interior, one on the driver's side, one on the passenger side. Lots of little knurled accents there. They rotate to open and close, but they do look pretty darn cool. They even have an illuminated little section right there in the middle. Well, we're talking about ambient lighting as we see in other Mercedes models. There's a, definitely a big ambient lighting game going on in here. We can do a multicolor theme where the upper line is different than the line that's actually kind of right under there. It's a little bit difficult to see during the day, but there's another ambient lighting strip right up in that area. And you can change the colors here. You can also opt for lights that are dynamic, depending on the effect that it's programmed to do. You can adjust the lighting brightness in different zones, and you can have the multicolor animation turn on, warning support, so when uh, the vehicle warns you about something, the ambient lighting changes, and operating feedback, so when you th do things like adjust the temperature, etc., things will change. Uh, over here, this energy one, this will actually change based on your throttle position. Personally, I think the animated themes are the coolest. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to see on camera, but basically there's a lighter section that sort of marches its way across the interior. Out on the road, the first thing to know about the EQE, especially the AMG EQE, is you need to be careful with your right foot because this has an amazing amount of power. Zero to 60 in 3.2 seconds. And that was at 45 miles an hour. You get pressed back in the seat like you absolutely would not believe if this vehicle is at its highest battery output. That statement requires a bit of explanation. If you're in the slippery mode, which is ice, snow, etc., then power output is limited to about 308 horsepower. If you're in the comfort drive mode, then it's 493 horsepower. If you're in sport, 555. If you're in sport plus, it's unleashed. Absolutely everything is available. And this is incredibly quick from practically any speed. The most noticeable difference between this and some high horsepower EVs is say the 40 to 60 or 40 to 70 mile an hour run. It is wicked, wicked fast in this Mercedes. So for this vehicle, it's not just about the absolutely stellar zero to 60 time. It's worth noting that if you get the performance pack version of this one, uh, the AMG Dynamics pack, that will go zero to 60 according to Motor Trend in 2.9 seconds. So we're talking very, very quick. Other thing to know is that my 3.2 seconds possibly could have been a little bit quicker if the surface had been better. There was a tiny bit of tire slip, so I suspect 3.1 might even be possible with this vehicle. Anyway you slice it, this is very fast. And the handling is epic. Around corners, it just absolutely grips. And that's thanks to the wide tires we have all the way around, 295 with tires in the back. Now the reason they're 295s at the back is because we get 396 horsepower in the rear, 221 horsepower up front. So this is definitely rear power biased all the time. Full out, obviously rear power biased, but even in part throttle situations, Mercedes has tuned this to be rear power biased. Unless we're in the slippery mode, then it seems to even out the power more equitably front and rear. But even at mild throttle applications, you definitely get wheel spin in the back before you get wheel spin in the front. Thanks to the wide tires we find up front and the less powerful electric motor in the front, 
we don't get torque steer like you can get in the Tesla Model S. And that would be even the regular Model S, not the Plaid model. You will feel the steering wheel fighting you a little bit. We also see that in a decent number of high performance EVs because there's no mechanical connection between front and rear. So it really takes a lot of work in order to try and control torque steer in a high horsepower and high torque EV. And Mercedes has done a fantastic job of that in this vehicle. They really wanted this to feel like an AMG model. Now about that, it doesn't really feel like an AMG model. In some ways it feels better, in some ways it can be a little bit worse, but it's always going to be a little bit different because of course we don't have an automatic transmission, we don't have a roaring V8 engine, we have a power delivery that no other AMG model has ever been able to give us. You stomp on the throttle and you just get gobs and gobs of power absolutely right away. You have to be very prepared before you step on the throttle. This is the kind of vehicle where both hands on the wheel, pay attention to what you're doing, be ready, then stomp on the throttle. You have a bit more of a delay, a bit more of an opportunity to get yourself sorted in the average AMG. The other thing that's important to know is that this is fairly heavy. We have that nearly 100 kilowatt hour battery pack under there, so this is significantly heavier than an E63 AMG. Mercedes has done a fantastic job with the tires and the low center of gravity and all of that. It's very, very obvious. This stops practically on a dime. I measured 106 feet from 60 miles an hour to zero. That is one of the best EV stopping distances we have ever measured. And very, very similar to the last E63 that we tested. It's pretty common for an E63 or an M5 to be right there around 100 feet. This is as close as makes no difference. As far as the handling score goes, clearly I'm gonna give this an A+. But versus the Mercedes E63, it's a little bit tricky. I don't have access to a skid pad, but I know folks that do. For instance, I have some friends over at Motor Trend. They recently tested this and an E63 on the skid pad. This actually got better skid pad numbers than the E63, 0.99 versus 0.97 for the gasoline Mercedes. However, we don't normally drive on a skid pad. We're normally out here driving on a road like this, where the road is going left and right. It's not just a single direction. And that's where mass comes into effect. Just going around a corner in one direction, this does very well. But when you need to change directions and then change directions again, then the E63 does better. EQE versus E63, it's simply a matter of physics. This is notably heavier than the E63, so it's gonna be harder for it to change directions. And even though we do have some pretty wide and grippy tires and we have that low center of gravity, etc., this is just not gonna handle quite like an E63. It's very, very close, but it's still just a notch below. This gravel road highlights the excellent ride characteristics on Mercedes AMG tuned air suspensions. What's really interesting about this is that we're in the S plus mode, the most aggressive suspension drive mode in this vehicle, and it's still very comfortable. If I move this over to the comfort mode, it has that classic solid Mercedes feel albeit with less suspension travel to damp the weight than you might think. So sometimes larger bumps, larger imperfections do make their way more into the cabin than you might expect, more than you'd find in say perhaps a Mercedes-Benz E-Class because we have a little bit more weight to contend with and about the same kind of suspension motion. So say that bump right there, you definitely felt that come into the cabin in a way that it doesn't in most versions of the E-Class. But this is still really well done and I would give this an A+. Plus especially considering the competition for this. You could compare this against the most powerful, fastest version of a Model 3. It's gonna be less expensive than this, but it's also gonna ride somewhat harsher than this. I'm not the biggest fan of that vehicle's suspension tuning. Now, on the other hand, the Model S, I think, rides pretty well. It also has an adaptive air suspension on it. And because of the origins of that and some of the Mercedes-Tesla coordination that was going on at the very beginning of Tesla, that does seem to have a somewhat Mercedes-like ride quality to it, but not quite as composed, not quite as well done, I would say, as what we find in here or in the EQS. And of course, if you're looking for something more supple, there is the EQS as well. For the same price tag, you wouldn't get as much power in the EQS, but you would get a slightly more comfortable ride and a slightly more spacious interior as well. The interesting twist is, when I sat down and thought about this and really put everything together, drove this back to back with an E63, and I thought to myself, or asked myself rather, is this really a real AMG? The answer is yes, but this is not electric E63. This has a very different feel. You can go around a corner like this, a little bit lazy, because you can then stab it and get this instant acceleration that you just cannot get in an E63. 
you would have had to have downshifted in advance. You'd have to wait for the turbochargers to spool up, etc. So while the E63 might get you around the corner faster, this is going to exit the corner faster without any sort of preparation. The E63 is definitely going to exit the corner quick, but not quite like that because it just doesn't have the ability to deliver that much torque that rapidly. And that is the fun and the promise of a full electric vehicle like this with enormous grippy tires. Especially with this AMG model, Mercedes has delivered on the full promise of an electric vehicle, but they've also wrapped it in the capabilities and design and ride quality, etc., that you've come to expect in a Mercedes. Some EVs are really just one trick ponies. They're really fast in a straight line, but they don't necessarily ride that well. They don't necessarily handle better than the gasoline counterparts. And this is one of those vehicles where it's definitely a ledger sheet that you have to tally up. But upon really recollecting that total, you'll see that this is very close to the E63, perhaps even better. It's going to excel in certain areas. The E63 is going to be better in other areas. But on balance, this is a solid AMG. Just like the regular EQE 500 and EQE 350, I was able to spend a little bit of time in a dealer provided EQE 350, are absolutely solid electric alternatives to the corresponding Mercedes-Benz E-Classes. Now, how does the new E-Class stack up? You'll have to wait on that one. We do know that there's a new E-Class coming soon and hopefully I will be driving it over the next few months. So be sure and stay tuned for that. In the meantime, bottom line, this is one of the best EVs that I have ever driven. Uh, a lot of people complain, how is it that reviewers say that every new car they drive is the best one they've driven? Well, uh, when Mercedes is designing a new EV like this one, they're not designing this to be mid-pack. They're designing this to be segment leading, and they hit the nail right on the head. Sometimes car companies miss the mark a little bit, but they're still solid top of the segment. This, I think, is absolutely top of the hill. I would buy the EQE over the Tesla Model S. I would even pay a little bit extra for this EQE, to be perfectly honest. I just love the blend of features, the, the handling capability, and the more traditional feel that we find in this, combined with the bonkers thrust that is only capable, uh, for only possible from a battery electric vehicle like this. Now let's roll through the pros and cons. Clearly we have the mind warping acceleration and fantastic handling in the AMG version, but this also applies to the rest of the EQE lineup. Everything in the EQE lineup is excellent when it comes to handling, and they all have a solid feel out on the road. And a feel that we don't really find in too many other EVs. This doesn't have the firm and bouncy ride that you find in a Tesla Model 3. It feels more like a classic Mercedes out on the road, and that's definitely something that I gravitate towards. However, if you want something that's even better handling, you will find a few options out there, but they're going to cost even more than the already pretty expensive AMG EQE. Something like a Porsche Taycan, it is definitely a little bit more fun to drive, but it will go up to nearly twice as expensive as the model that we were driving in this video. Now, on the middling side of things, we do have level two charge speeds that are not as fast as I would like. It tops out just over nine and a half kilowatts on the onboard level two charger. DC fast charge speeds, those aren't too bad, just over 200 kilowatts, and it will sustain that for a reasonable amount of time, but it's certainly not going to gain range as quickly as some of the competition. Now let's roll through the competition. From Germany, we have the BMW i4. This is not really an EQE competitor, as I said before. It starts at about $52,000 for the base version. The M50 version is going to be about $69,000 starting, so still decently less expensive than the EQE and decently smaller as well. It's based on the 4 Series, which is sort of the 3 Series without window frames on the door, so not quite the same thing there. Then we have the upcoming Polestar 4. We don't have any pricing on that, but it's probably going to be size-wise more like the EQE. We have the Porsche Taycan, $90,900 is where the Taycan starts, and it will end at around $192,000 currently. More options are constantly being added. Now, if you would prefer a Taycan hatchback, there's one of those. And if you want to take configuration to the next level, even beyond the millions of options that Mercedes has, then there's the Porsche model for you. It is going to be a bit more fun to drive, a bit more performance focused than even the AMG version of the EQE, but it's also going to be a lot more expensive. Then we, of course, have the Tesla lineup. Let's talk about this in more detail. The Model 3 is an interesting option. It's pretty roomy on the inside, even 
though it is smaller than the EQE. It's also going to be a lot less expensive, 40240 for the base version. If you want the Model 3 Performance, that is definitely less expensive than the EQE AMG, but interestingly has very similar 0 to 60 times, about 3.1 seconds. Then we have the Tesla Model S, which is definitely a very different vehicle than the Model 3. Dimensionally, it's a bit bigger than the EQE in some dimensions. On the inside, it is honestly pretty close. Price-wise, it's also pretty close to a decent number of EQE trims. 87,490 is where the base dual motor version starts. That will get you 0 to 60 in 3.1 seconds. So very similar performance in that model as well. It is very, very, very fast. And if you want to go even faster, you could get the Plaid model for 107,490. So right about the same price as an EQE AMG. Model S range is also pretty decent because it has a bigger battery pack and Tesla is really focused on efficiency. They've been at this game for longer than Mercedes in the full electric models like this, and I think it shows when it comes to the relative efficiency scores. The next competitor you really should keep an eye on is the electrified G80 from Genesis. This is a really intriguing option because it's not an eGMP platform EV like the Ionic 6 or Ionic 5, but basically they took the eGMP bits and they jammed them under the body of a regular old G80. So it looks just like an average Genesis midsize luxury sedan. And it has the same luxurious interior with a lot of standard feature content like big screens, Napa leather upholstery, etc. It doesn't have the same level of opulence or luxury options that you find in the Mercedes. And indeed, there's a lot less customization going on because you really just pick your interior color and your exterior color, and that's it. The G80 Electrified comes just one way fully loaded. But it does have a lot going for it. The range is slightly longer than the all-wheel drive versions of the EQE. All-wheel drive is standard on the G80 Electrified. Uh, 282 miles versus 260 miles of range in comparable versions. 0 to 60 times, a little bit faster, 4.1 seconds versus 4.5 seconds in the others. And it's going to charge faster because all of the electrical bits came from eGMP. So it has a faster level two charger, so it's going to charge faster at home. It also has a smaller battery pack, so it doesn't take as long to fill it, even if you're charging at the same rate. And DC fast charging is particularly swift thanks to its 800 volt native architecture. It'll go 10% to 80% in just 22 minutes. That is a little bit longer than the GV60, but that's because it has a slightly bigger battery pack. So it charges at about the same rate, Bigger battery pack means it's going to take about four minutes longer. The obvious downside to the Genesis is going to be the logo on the hood, which is not a Mercedes logo, and for a lot of shoppers, that is definitely important. Which brings us along to the last competitor, which has to be the E63. The E63 does get pretty expensive, and when I really started digging into things, I was actually a bit more surprised by this because I had forgotten somehow that the E63 can get up to about $152,000, which means that the EQE AMG is the value alternative to an E63 AMG. That I did not expect somehow. Now, admittedly, there are still a few features that you can get in the E-Class AMG that you cannot get in the EQE. So in that respect, it is sort of like the EQS versus S-Class. You can't get all the S-Class things in the EQS. But comparably equipped, they're actually going to be pretty similar, if not a little bit less expensive, over on the electric side of things. As I said before, choosing between the AMG EQE and the AMG E63 is really difficult because these two vehicles are so much fun. And if I were to score them just going down the list, the things that I love about the vehicles, the lists would be pretty equal and the scores would be pretty equal. But the highlights in each vehicle are different. The handling, nimbleness, and the feel that we get in the E63 I think is superior. You get that fun engine noise. In the EQE, you get the fantastic acceleration, still solid handling, etc. A slightly quieter interior in some situations, but not quite the same sort of sharpness that we find in the E63. Bottom line, this is solidly a real AMG. And it makes a lot of sense for someone that is shopping for the E63, and maybe you just want to go in a slightly different direction. Maybe you want something that's more fun in a different way, or the same amount of fun in a different way. Or you might be looking for a slightly less expensive lease, regardless of the version of EQE or E-Class you're looking at. The E-Class may start a little bit less expensive than the EQE, but the EQE actually leases a little bit less. So right now you can get an EQE 350 for $689 a month in the United States versus $789 in the E350. Now the EQE's lease does require an extra $1,000 down on it at the moment, but any way you slice it, it's still going to be a little less expensive over three years versus 
versus a regular E-Class lease. And of course, it's going to be less expensive to operate as well. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below. And what do you think about Mercedes doing this two different vehicles direction in their design, having a separate E-Class and a separate EQE versus what we're seeing from BMW and from Genesis, where they have a gasoline car and then they just make an electric version of that gasoline car. Would you have rather that Mercedes did that? I'll see all of you next week.